Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. And thank you so much for joining us again. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us today. We pray now that you would implant your word within us that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of you, that we may become those that bear much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text for today is found in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That's James, chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. Verse 19 reads, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of which is able to save your souls. Our subject for today is receive the word, receive the word. Now, James calls God's word the engrafted word, or which means uh, the implanted word. Now, borrowing from uh, our Lord's parable of the sower, uh, Matthews chapter 13, verse 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. James compares God's word to seeds and the human heart to soil. In his parable, Jesus described four kinds of hearts. The hard heart, which did not understand or receive the word and therefore bore no fruit. Then the shallow heart which was very emotional, but uh, had no depth and bore no fruit. The crowded heart, which lacked repentance and permitted sin to crowd out the word and the fruitful heart, which received the word and allowed it to take root and produce a harvest of fruit. Now, the final test of salvation is fruit bearing. And this means a changed life. As we Christians with new character and conduct minister to others in the glory of God, they that are in Christ are new creatures. Behold, all things have become brand new. Now, this fruit might be winning souls to Christ. Uh, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, that talks about the righteous shall live by faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 22, talks about growing in holiness, in holy living. It reads, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. And then Romans chapter 15 verse 28 talks about sharing our material possession. Now all of these are signs of a changed life and will bear much fruit. So sharing our material possessions, Romans chapter 15 verse 28 says, when therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. In other words, Paul is saying that, that you, have, you all have collected and I'm the deliverer. Uh, and, 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 and it's such a good thing to, to be around people that don't mind sharing. You, your journey will be long and, and, and not tedious, 
but you'll have a lot of places to go and a lot of things to do if you just get a grasp of the importance of sharing. And then spiritual character. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says, but, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And then good works. According to Galatians, uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good works and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then the last one I believe it is, is praising the Lord. When we praise the Lord, we are destined to bear good fruit. But don't, don't think that that's all you got to do. You got to do the other things also. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledges his name. A lot of stuff we do with the lip is not praising God. Uh, now, religious work may be manufactured, but they do not have life in them, nor do they bring glory to God. Real fruit has in it the seed uh, for more fruit so that the harvest continues to grow fruit, more fruit, much fruit according to John chapter 15, verse one through five. But the word of God cannot work in our lives unless we receive it in the right way. Jesus not only said, take heed what ye hear in Mark chapter four, verse 24, but he also said, take heed how ye hear in Luke chapter eight, verse 18. Too many people are in that tragic condition in which hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Matthew, according to Matthew chapter 13, verse 13, they attend Bible classes and church worship, but never seem to grow. Is it the fault of the teacher or the preacher? Perhaps in some cases, but in, but it is uh, it may also be the fault of the hearer. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 reminds us that it is possible to be dull of hearing because of decay of the spiritual life. If the seed of the word is to be planted in our hearts, then we must obey the instructions James gives us, and he gives us four points that will help us. The first point is swift to hear. Swift to hear. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 9. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, according to Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Now, just as the servant is quick to hear his master's voice and the mother to hear her baby's smallest cry, so the believer must be quick to hear what God has to say. There uh, is a beautiful il illustration of this truth in the life of King David. I wish I had time to really uh, go into that, that example found in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14 through 17. But it talks about uh, David was hiding from the Philistines who were in possession of uh, Bethlehem. And he yearned for a drink of the cool water from the well in Bethlehem, a well that he had often visited in his boyhood and youth. Now, he did not issue an order to his men. He simply said to himself, 
Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate, according to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15. Now, three of his mighty men, his warriors, his soldiers, heard their king's sigh for the water, and they risked their lives to secure to get him some of that water and bring it to him. They were swift to hear as a newborn babe desiring the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. A sign of growth is through obedience. Now, the second point is slow to speak. Slow to speak. We have ears, two ears, and one mouth, which ought to remind us to listen more than we speak as we talk about slow to speak. We ought to be hearing more than we say. Too many times we argue with God's word. Don't leave me now. If not audible, if not in, in our words, at least in our heart and our minds. He that refraineth his lips is wise, says uh, Solomon in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. And then chapter 17, verse 27, he says, he that hath knowledge spareth his words. And then there's another verse that says, a fool is known by his many words. Now, instead of being slow to speak, the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, argued with Jesus by asking, and who is my brother or my neighbor rather? In the early church, the services were informal and often the listener could debate with the speaker. There were even fightings and wars among the brethren. And James was writing uh, to some of these word fighters. Now, the, the third point is slow to wrath. Don't get angry at God or his word. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalted folly according to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. When the prophet Nathan told King David the story about the stolen ewe lamb, the king became angry, but at the wrong person. Uh, Nathan told him, thou art the man. And then David quit arguing and confessed, I have sinned. In the garden, Peter was slow to hear, swift to speak, and swift to anger. And he almost killed a man with the sword. And many church fights are the result of short tempers and hasty words. There is a godly anger against sin, according to Ephesians 4.26. And if we love the Lord, we must hate sin based upon the instructions in Psalms 97 verse 10. But man's anger does not produce God's righteousness. In fact, anger is just the opposite of patience. God wants to produce in our lives as we mature in Christ, according to James chapter uh, 1, verse 3 and 4. James warns us against getting angry at God's word because it reveals our sins to us. Have you ever been in a Bible class and, 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 and the teacher was simply uh, delivering God's word? And you got angry because God's word was exposing to you. 
wasn't spreading your business all to everybody in the class, just to you. A lot of times we can, just because we sit in a class or sit and listen to a sermon does not mean that we are being convicted. But when God's word convicts us, we tend to not get uh, angry at God according to basically we think we're not, but we get angry at the deliverer, the male person. But in reality, we are really getting angry at God. Just like the man who broke the mirror because he disliked the image in it. People rebel against God's word because it tells the truth about them and their sinfulness. The last point, and then I'll be finished, is a prepared heart. A prepared heart. James saw the human heart as a garden. If nothing is done to it, the soil would produce only weeds. He urged us to carefully pull out the weeds and prepare the soil for the implanted word of God. The phrase superfluity of naughtiness gives the picture of a garden overgrown with weeds that cannot be controlled. It is foolish to try to receive God's word into an unprepared heart. How do we prepare uh, the soil of our heart for God's word? First thing is by confessing our sins and asking the Father to forgive us, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Then by meditating on God's love and grace and asking him to plow up any hardness in our hearts, break up our fallow ground and sow uh, not among thrones. You just plant among thrones or weeds. The weeds have a good chance of drowning out or smothering out the word of the seed. And then finally, we must have an attitude of meekness. An attitude of meekness, uh, James chapter 1 verse 21. Meekness is the opposite of wrath. And when we receive the word with meekness, we accept it. Do not argue with it and honor it as the word of God. We do not try to twist it, to conform it to our thinking. If we do not receive the implanted word, then we are deceiving ourselves when we attend worship and Bible study and nothing about us ever changes. Christians who like to argue various points of views may be only fooling themselves. They think that their discussions are promoting spiritual growth when in reality, they may only be cultivating weeds. Jesus was very careful not to destroy the wheat with the weeds or to tear. And when he returns, he don't want us messing around trying to, to tear up the weed and get it out of the tear. He said, I'll take care of that when I return. He was careful not to destroy the wheat with the weeds or the tares when he gave his life for the whole world and, and leaves it up to each believer to ex accept his gift of eternal life. He died on a hill called Calvary. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, but early the third day, early in the morning, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand, power to save to the utmost. Let me share this poem with you and then uh, I'll leave you alone for today. 
it's a form that's called the farmer and the plow. I, I, I received this poem from a close friend of mine that's going on to be with the Lord now, Hugh Love. The farmer plows through the field of green, and the blade of the plow is sharp and keen. But the seed must be sown to bring forth grain, for nothing is born without suffering and pain. And God never plows in the soul of man without intention and purpose and pain. So whenever you feel the plow sharp blade, let not your heart be sorely afraid. For like the farmer, God chooses a field from which he expects an excellent yield. So rejoice, though your heart is broken in two, God seeks to bring forth a rich harvest in you. That poem is by Helen Steiner Rice. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, choosing us in our hearts to implant your word. We pray now that you would let it grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to, to, to receive your word so that we can uh, grow by it. And as we grow, we can show growth by the way that we do the things that honor you the most. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So long, see you next time. Bye-bye.